So should we just rename this to Sunday Morning Ramblings or what? Um, no, that's up to you, man. You're the one that's in charge of the channel. Like, pff, like it, it's been a few. The last two weeks have been kind of on me. Let's just let's just put it like that. Hashtag um, blame Lewis. Yeah, let's just blame me. But I think, hypothetically, probably speaking, that from now on, maybe, 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 I should be good. Because last week, I was getting drunk because exams are done. This week, I was busy packing because I'm going home. And that, those are my valid excuses. So, I don't know. Well, you know what that means, is if, it ever, if you ever delay it again... You're completely screwed because you won't have a reason anymore. Well, I'll make a reason. Like, I... <laughs> You'll just find something to pin it yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Just like, oh man, I stabbed myself in the foot. I will you stab can still myself talk in the with foot a fork to delay in your foot. this. <laughs> Alright, let's get into the shows because I imagine some shows we won't have too much to say about, but then other shows we might have a lot to say about. So yeah, we should probably is. get right into it. So... Yeah. First up, uh, our usual, Cabinary. What did you think of this week's episode of Cabinary, Lewis? Uh, it's become the status quo now that I just think, like, it's stupid, really. <laughs> um, like, I guess my first problem with it was that they, I, I said this during the episode, they seem to be fluctuating a lot too much on what uh, people think about Cabinary, especially Mume. Because um, within this episode, there were probably... I think there were two fluctuations. Like, they started off hating her, and then they liked her, then they hated her again. Or, my the opposite way around, I forget. I think it was, they started off hating her, and then they liked her, and then they hated her. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, no, that, that that's going to be a... I feel like that's going to be a thing to worry about. If they're going to continue that for the entire season of it, it's going to be a theme that I'm already sick of. So, that isn't pleasant to watch. And it's definitely a, a downside. I've saw solid criticism. Because the only thing that... Well, uh, that's actually... I was going to say, like, the the only thing to Mume is what everyone else thinks of her. But now we actually got some backstory on Mume. Um, as vague as it was. But it's something. Uh, other than that... Um, the entire... What was it? The, the what do they call it? A fusion? No, no. A big entity. I I forget what they actually called the super uh, cabine. Um It was just like the black cloud. I just called it like an amalgamation or something. Yeah, no. But they sh movie called it something. Uh, black cloud. It had like. Yeah, I think um, it had a specific name. She said it was a colony or something similar to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that. Um, well, they did a good job of making it not feel threatening within an episode <laughs> of it appearing like they, it's kind of funny like they they build it up as this big bad evil guy that will destroy all of humanity as its one and only mission but then they just blast two shots into it and it's dead which is kind of mellow, uh, you know anticlimactic but whatever um but I'll be one of them was an actual like cannon shot, but it it, it was still fine. Uh, yeah, no, other than that, drama has been crap. Uh, it actually creating tension is also crap. Overall, it's just been a pretty stupid show. Uh, to 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 be fair on that colony thing, I think yeah, well yeah, sure they already got rid of it because they found a cannon. Which was it even mentioned before this episode? Before they got it, like the whole like they Pig probably like looked cannon, at it, called it and that was it. Yeah, like they just sort of like, hey, we've got a cannon now. Woo. <laughs> but I mean, to be fair, it feels like the colony thing was more of like it. It, it was it was less like literally threatening and more about like implications like because of what mume saw in it it seems like what i got the impression was is the possibility of those things being created by cabinary that lose their shit based on everything that happened in this episode that was the impression i was getting and if that is mm. true 
kudos to them actually giving out information without being incredibly blunt about it. Um, That's true. Outside of that, I kind of agree. I, It's sort of the same. Like, I, I didn't hate this episode, not as much as the last two. It was just sort of like, all right, this is an episode where things are happening. Yeah. Um, it was more of, like, kind of just neutral ground for me. But to be, entire, to, to be fair to the show, like, I can't ignore things that I like when I see it. And I will say that while I don't care for the bond between the MC and um, uh, Mumei that they're seem to be going for i do like the uh the bit of i'm not sure if it's called a bond or like a what's the word looking for? The, the the little bit of a clash I, I, between the mc and the head bodyguard dude the guy with the sword like oh yeah their little their little exchange as he was like you know saying he was going to use the sword was actually really cool like their their dialogue where he's like you know oh i'm gonna use the sword and the guy's like what did he say? Like, don't break it or something, or don't blame the sword or something? Oh yeah, yeah. Don't blame the sword if it doesn't yeah, work, something like that. Yeah, and, and he was just like completely straight faced, like hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was that was actually a cool little exchange between them. So I'm actually looking like I'm looking forward to seeing that bond develop. Although I know the show doesn't give as much of a shit about it as I do. No, no. But just that, like, that was a nice little exchange that I really liked. Um, and then outside of that, and the positive on the. The colony thing, yeah. I'd say this episode was just whatever, though. I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement there. Yeah, no, like, um, it seems that, like, the show is practically going to force-feed us uh, Ikuma and Mumei for the entirety of it. Maybe we'll get something extra with um, IMA and Ikuma, but that's, that's a stretch. Um, though, I still feel like this is going to be Mume's arc. This is just going to be her arc for the show. And then she'll have a little bit uh, of uh, character development within, I don't know, some certain events that happen throughout the next show. But then once they, I don't know, get to the next town or settlement or whatever, or on the way to the town, they'll probably um, start going towards some of the other characters, maybe. Um, hope, I I think they they're gonna start looking at IMA next since she's had uh I guess a start to her development. She's become like not she's started off as that innocent kind of bystander to it all, and now she's kind of the leader of the pact, um, kind of. So I feel like there's gonna be some sort of I don't know inner struggle within her that you know it's gonna be helped along Ikuma. This could just be me hoping for the best here and hoping that they're going to actually do something other than do something with other than Ikuma and Mume. But I feel like that's the direction which they're going to go now. So. Yeah, that's definitely a possibility. It, it's, it's another one of those episodes where it's like, well, not the episode itself, but the show's to the point where it's like, well, this was an improvement on the last two episodes but at the same time it like wasn't really like good enough so it's still kind of a question of whether the upward trend will continue or if we're just going to stay stagnant now or if it's going to drop back down again seeing as it's your tetsuro araki show it's probably going to do all three it's going to go up and down all over the place i'm willing to bet like i'm mm. i would not be surprised if there is an episode down the line that we think is great and then there's going to yeah. be another episode that we think is going to be the worst shit we've ever seen. Like, that's a, how a lot of the stuff Tetsuraki does is because he goes all in on stuff. Like, that's just how his style is. So you either are into it and then therefore you are completely, you know, pulled along with the ride. I mean, we all saw the crazy following Attack on Titan had. And then there are the people who can't really get into, you know, aren't completely on board when, when Araki cranks it up to 11 and you're just left in the cold and you're like, what the fuck is this? It's... It's almost like there's no middle ground. Like, if you're on board, like, you're completely pumped and going with it and the adrenaline's going and you're cheering and it's, and it's amazing. Or you haven't managed to, like, completely get that connection. And so when you get shit like smiling babies at the end of a <laughs> fucking fight, it's just the funniest shit you've ever seen. Mm. Instead of, like, I, I don't know, the, the the happy, cheerful thing it was supposed to be. Enduring you know? and all that, yeah. Um. Yeah, no, I, I agree that there's going to be... I know there's going to be an episode down the line where something's going to happen to Ikuma because he, he, other than Aime, he's probably my favorite character. Uh, something's going to happen to him, something major um, along the lines of, I don't know, 
Aaron getting his ass handed to him by the uh, the female Titan. And Attack on Titan, that's going to kind of, I don't know, make me care for him or some shit. And that will actually be the episode that I like. Um, but on the same token, there's probably going to be something that is just going to be... That's going to counter that, and it's just going to be completely devastating to watch, no matter what how you look it from. Um, but Carbonary so far has just been, <laughs> despite it being a, a show about train, um, while they're on a train and they make gotta go 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 gotta go forward but on that train, it, it's a train wreck. Really, it, it doesn't feel like it has any sense of direction. The only direction they got going right now is. Um, go to next town, hopefully survive there, and fess off Carbonary. But, that being said, I think for a show of Carbonary's nature, where it's literally just humanity versus threat, um, that's all they really need. It's just a survival show, and they're just going to base it on characters and interactions along the way. I don't know. <laughs> and so far, those character stories and interactions... Well, they're not really um, making me hope for the best of what's to come, which is unfortunate because I did have a lot of high hopes going into the show. Um, so, but hey, I could just be super cynical. I could just be like, you know, super cynical right now, and I could be completely wrong. I want to be proven wrong. I desperately want to be proven wrong. Yeah, it's it could go either way. It's really hard to say, honestly. Mm. Um. But as far as this episode, was was that all you wanted to, to mention? Yeah, no. Like, <laughs> I mainly talked about what's, what I wanted in the next few episodes rather than what happened in this episode, but whatever. Yeah, it was kind of hard to really get too much from this episode anyway, honestly. Mm. It was more of like a implication of stuff that's going to happen later on, yeah. which is fine for a show to do. It's just, you know, <laughs> nothing about the episode itself to really say. Yeah, it was mainly just action this episode, I feel. For the most part. Yeah. So that means we should move on to the next show, which is uh, Boku Hero no Academia. So mm -hmm. what did you think of this week's episode of Hero Academia, Lewis? Well, like, I, I feel like I, I was going to, um, I feel like I did say a while ago that I will start to enjoy Academia more if they start um, putting an emphasis on their side characters. They did that this episode, so I liked the episode. Um, you said the exact same thing last week. Did I? Yeah, you were like, I wanted more. I want stuff for the side characters from from Hero Academia, and they sort of did that. So I like this episode. <laughs> you said the uh, same thing last week. Uh well, like they did it this. They did it more this episode. Like, um, I really enjoyed Bakuko's um backstory. Like, it, it had made me um I don't know what what's what's the word uh. It did essentially prove all my uh, criticisms wrong, I guess, of Bakugo because he his entire backstory makes his character make sense. Like it, it was so perfectly well done from the fact that like he himself was that sort of leader of the group um, from an early age. And when he got his quirk and how it was like, everyone was like, man, you're so cool, Bakugo. That is so amazing. And he was just, there's one line that I absolutely loved that uh, ba that young Bakugo kid said. I was like, yeah, I'm right. I am fucking awesome. Paraphrasing, obviously, but you know. <laughs> and I just love that um, line there. That, because that essentially defined how he kind of became the way he was. He had that, that quirk you know, established his superiority complex that was, um, which made him start that rivalry with Deku. And everything with that backstory with him, I would say that it, it, it probably came at the right time, which is annoying because I desperately wanted something from Bakuko earlier on in the show, but it came at the right time while he was having that fight with Deku so it had like his actions later in the episode had the most amount of weight it possibly would have um but Bakugo's backstory is probably it made him I wouldn't necessarily have his actions justified 
but they make them surely understandable. Like, you know why he's doing the things. He's a complete dick for doing so, but it everything with, like, his superiority complex to how he m thrives to be better than Deku, and that's what pretty much is that makes his character good, is how he wants to be De better than Deku, and the fact that, like, he's... The fact that he he was begging him to use his quirk for the entirety of the thing it was just, and the fact that Deku wouldn't use it was just a complete insult to Bakugo was fantastic. Like he, the fact that he didn't want a simple one-on-one -on -one CQC shit going down. He wanted like a quirk versus quirk thing, um, which he got in a way. Uh, and Jesus, I just really, really in enjoyed Bakugo this episode. Uh, thing, Ida. I Ida? Was was that his name? Guy voiced by uh, Kaito Ishik Ishikawa? Um, yeah, dude, it's, it's, really it's spelled like... It's like L-I-D-A? Or is it I -L No, it, it's Ida. I think it was just like the capitalization of the I made it look like Lida, but... Yeah, I think it's I-L-D-A, so it's like Ida or something? Ida, yeah. Yeah, no, he... I must say, when he, like, um, started playing the villain, yeah, or when I, God, that was hilarious. <laughs> it made me really genuinely laugh outside, laugh out loud. And, like, he, he, it was, one especially the line where, um, it, it was such an unvillainous thing, it was like, but it was so goddamn fun, I was like, look, I cleaned this entire room, so you have nothing to, to like, turn on, touch on and make everything go gravity upwards, like, it, it was, that was perfect. I forget that gravity upwards is exactly what he said, but like, um, oh, totally, yeah, uh, but yeah, no, very, very good episode of uh, Academia. The ending was smart. Well, I wouldn't say s well. I guess it was smart. Um, it played to the abilities of the the hero is great. Um, and I really enjoyed the fact that they kind of are. Setting uh, Bakugo apart from uh, the rest of the heroes, the fact that like even they were going, well, he's a little bit of a dick. That isn't a very hero thing to do. So I'm kind of interested what the implica implica uh, implications of uh, his actions are going to cause on the rest of the group. You know, will this everyone will go flocking towards uh, Deku and it's just compliment of how great a hero he was while um, everyone will kind of ostracize Bakugo, which is a complete flip on what they were like as a child. So it's going to be interesting how they handle it next episode. So basically, summing up all your thoughts on this episode is basically what I said last week was exactly correct. Uh, what did you say last week, man? I was saying how you were going to get more about Bakugo this episode and that the side character stuff was coming. And you're just like, I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm not feeling it. And I explained all this stuff about... To be fair, I wasn't entirely correct about Bakugo's backstory and the way he acts the way he does. But some of it I got right. And my whole point about, you know, his actions being understandable, not necessarily justifiable. Basically, the point is, I'm right and I'm a genius, right? Nah, that doesn't sound like me. <laughs> uh, I'm right. Anyways, my my thoughts on the episode are pretty similar. I liked it a lot. Um, I also knew it was coming. It was interesting to get hardcore, uh, like information on Bakugo's character because, like I said last week, was largely just like guessing from inferences about his character for the most part. So it was nice mm. to get like solid ground as far as like everything goes. And yeah, it, it was cool to, to see uh, how they made that work. Like, they it, it was, on the one hand, it was blunt, but on the other hand, it also, like, wasn't blunt. Like, it, it you definitely understand why he acts the way he does, but all of, like, the reasoning and stuff and, like, the, the more specific aspects of it are a little more vague. Like, the fact that, you know, it's it's all these people just telling him how good he is. Like, a lot of it isn't even, like, his own, like, you could say that... He doesn't even, he's not even necessarily, like, self-centered himself. It was just from growing up with all these people saying, even, like, teachers saying how amazing he is and his quirk <laughs> is so cool and it's fantastic and he's going to get all these, you know, ghosts somewhere, you know? <laughs> and that really, like, it, it grew this self-centered attitude into him. 
which is why, you know, like you said, he, he developed this leader mindset of like, I'm the best. I have to be, you know, better than everyone at everything, you know, which is why this quirkless idiot getting into this, you know, school that he wants to get into is such a huge blow to him. And the fact that it's like, you know, his baseball throw was, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was further than Baku goes. And even I, if it wasn't. Yeah, it's was pretty similar. It, I, yeah, I, it was either similar or I think he may have beaten it. But the regardless, like, even if he didn't, the, the fact that he has this crazy strength, you know, obviously in a quirk is just like, Baku's like, what the fuck's happening? Like, <laughs> this is bullshit. <laughs> this is not what I was told. So... <laughs> Yeah, it, it was cool to really see in this episode. It'll be interesting to see if other characters have similar episodes. I mean, I, I don't doubt that they're going to get, get developed as we go on, but I don't know if they'll get, like, single-focused episodes like Bakugou got this one, simply because we've seen Bakugou since the beginning. So mm. I don't know if everyone else will get their episodes to them. Hopefully we can get on our, our Naval Laser Guy episode, but, I mean, who fucking knows? It's, yeah. Yeah. Actually, you know what was a funny takeaway from this episode? One of the things that stuck with me the most, other than all the stuff with Bakugo that I wasn't even thinking about, was that, like, I can't believe I remember it, is that Ikuma is in Hero Academia now. Yeah, yeah, no, he is. He's doing the exact same voice as well, which was kind of striking. Exactly. Well. <laughs> like, it, was, it wasn't even really that switched up. Like, I recognized it instantly. Yeah. That, so, it's just like, the it fuck? It's so weird, like, because... I thought he'd do, like, you know, some, like, his Ushio Totoro voice. Like, his more shonen like, superhero voice. But no, he's doing his, like, goddamn edgy Kabane killer voice. They must have drilled that voice into him in Kabane, and now he can't yeah, stop yeah. doing it. He's stuck with it. That's uh, his voice now forever. Maybe. Maybe it's similar to... I can't remember the name off the top of my head. Is it, is it Sakurai? The guy who voiced the villain in Psycho Pass. Oh, uh... Yeah, yeah, Takahiro Sakurai. Yeah, ever since he did that role in Psychopath, he's been doing the Makashima voice every show that he gets a role in. So, though, to be fair, he may he may be hired because of that. Like, they're like, do that voice you did for Psychopath. That was good. And they mm. give him all those, like, similar character roles of, like, psychotic villains that are, like, also cool-headed. Yeah, yeah. Well, cool-headed is kind of his thing. He's either that or just, like, you know, a lead in, like, a Sojo thing of just being, like, a bully. <laughs> Well, yeah. you say he's cool-headed as his thing, but his big, first big major role, or maybe it wasn't his first one, but his, another major big role he had was fucking Suzaku in Code Geass, which is the opposite that, of cool-headed. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, he's kind of known for to be that, like, kind of, like, hot guy who's always playing in the shown in, in the shoujo things. It's always, like, it's always the, 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 the love interest, the, the cool level love interest that's always, like, you know, be shown in. I don't know really how to describe him. He always says those sort of things. <laughs> Suzaku is really an outlier for him, like... Yeah, maybe. I, I, I guess that could just be the case of Suzaku being the outlier more than anything. But it's mm. just, like, w with careers like this, you would think that you know, they would do roles like that that are really popular, and then, you know, they get hired more because they're like, you know, we like that voice. Sometimes they do different voices, but, I mean, if you're, you know, yeah, Kugumi or Rei, they just want the same voice. So <laughs> they, you know, that that's what's, you know, boosts your popularity and then your roles and stuff. And I don't know, maybe, maybe he was falling a bit off the radar before he did Makashima or something, but yeah. that was what put him right back on, which then just skyrocketed all the roles he got. But, uh... He's been doing a couple different roles lately, which is actually kind of nice to see. But we got into VA talk, so... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you probably shouldn't go too off. Uh, was, was there anything else with Hero Academia you wanted to mention, Lewis? Um, They finally let Yuki Kaji speak, which is something. Continuing that VA talk. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Was that it? Yeah, no, that's it. Yep. Uh, I thought so. I'm... I'm kind of going through this quicker because we usually take a little over an hour each week and we need to kind of like crunch it down a bit, but also because I, I don't know about you, but there's like a quadrillion things to talk about this episode's week's episode of ReZero, so I kind of mm. wanted to get to it. Uh, you can go first since my memory's a little hazy, so. Of this episode of ReZero? This, okay, this episode of ReZero is like the what if episode almost, because the the tone the show has going for it, like, we knew at some point Subaru was going to lose his shit with all this, you know, his powers and everything that comes as a result of it. It was just a matter of how are they going to show it. 
they could have either had it be a gradual thing where it grows and grows over the course of the series and like ends up being a climax thing near the end or they could do what they did in this and have it be the one-off episode where you know what if Subaru is done with this what if he can't take it anymore and it was and it also served as like the determination episode in a way you know he mm. he has he loses all hope he doesn't want to work on anything anymore he's he's had it he it's too much stress and pain on him and he gives up and then by the end of the episode he realizes that giving up and taking the easy way out just causes more harm than good not just for him but in general and in a way he's it's kind of fucked up when you think about it, because it's almost like he has a role put on him where, like, he has to fix everything, <laughs> or else everything's just fucked up more than if he hadn't, and he has to shoulder that in acceptance that, you know, it also gives him the happy outcome. You know, it's not even just a case of, like, you know, he mentioned in the earlier episodes, I think it was the very first episode, you know, like, doing, you know, it was a bit of a, you know, fake little thing he was doing for Amelia, but... His, you know, oh, you know, good deeds for the day, you know, helping out other people and stuff like that. And, you mm. know, the, the mentality of helping out other people should always be, like, a good thing. But the situation that Subaru's in is almost, like, uh, like fucked up that he has to help people. Because otherwise then it just fucks him over, too. It's, it's, it's like there's no, like, there is no easy way out. If he takes the <laughs> allegedly easy way out, shit's fucked up. And if he does... You know, he tries to help everybody. He gets killed a bunch of times. It's like he there's there's nothing he can do, which just endears me more to his character. And mm. well, a lot of people who didn't like Subaru's character that much like this episode, it seems because of, you know, he, he dropped that a lot. But on the other hand, it was supposed to be kind of sad that he dropped it because like, you know, his bubbly, you know, kind of happy personality, you know, cheering everyone up was like completely gone yeah. and like looked how fucked shit was. So... But outside of that, like, the episode itself was great. Like, we learned so much this episode, it's absurd. Yeah. Like, there's there's the obvious shit we learned, which is that he cannot tell people about his time power of, mm. you know, re coming back after death. We saw what, <laughs> what happened when he tried to do that. So something is preventing him from doing that, and he can't just tell people, which is nice, because I didn't really see it that much, but that answers, you know, that crowd of people that's like, why doesn't he just tell people? <laughs> I never thought yeah. that question, because I didn't think it would really help him at all, but, mm. um, like, I mean, what the fuck is telling people gonna do anything, you know? Like, he'll still get shit fucked up. Like, he tries different things all this arc, and he still gets fucked up. Like, yeah. I, I didn't see what telling people would do anything, but that's a side point. Um, we also learned that the sickness was not caused by the maids because one of them fucking died from it when Subaru wasn't in his room. Mm. So it claims, it seems like it claims a specific person is my guess. We don't have like a solid direct information saying this, but it seems like whatever this sickness is that makes people like, well, it says they die from weakness, but apparently if you're awake during the process, you puke your guts everywhere. Mm. So it seems to target one person and maybe... It seems like it intentionally tries to go for Subaru because it's been hitting him all those times. But if he's not there, it's a question of does it go for, you know, Blue after that? Or was she just what it chose this time? Is it, is it a case of, like, Subaru being directly targeted but because he's not there it chooses someone at random? Or is there, like, a tier list? Like, if it can't get Subaru then it goes for Blue next, you know? It's, mm -hmm. it's really hard to say, which is what we're going to obviously explore next episode because it's the big question we don't know yet like we know who killed Subaru now all the other times you know as far as like blunt objects and you know arms yeah. and limbs getting cut off we know who killed him in that regard but as far as dying from the weakness we don't know like we have no fucking idea so <laughs> that's the only thing really left for it to cover which you know maybe he'll find out next episode and then they'll solve it the episode after or maybe we'll find out and solve it next episode it's really hard to say but uh but not even the was so good about this episode was not just the information that we learn is like like that's all the obvious shit you learn but if you like pay attention like and like connect the dots on your own from shit like all this information that's blunt also tells you so many other things for example like it didn't directly tell you but both times he died this time and then the previous time well not this time as in the end of this episode but as far as like the beginning of this episode and then the one before that yeah. Both of the maids kill him. Not just Blue. It's Blue wields the giant fucking mace, and then all the wind magic that's cutting off his limbs and shit is red. Like, they're both doing it. 
So what I think is actually the case, I had the theory of like the killer being swapped and I was sort of right if my theory is right, which is that last time, because he spent more time with Blue, Red was the one who wanted to, you know, torture him and get all the information out of him, but Blue gave him the swift death. Whereas mm. this episode, he was more associated with Red. So Blue was torturing him, trying to get information, and then Red slit his throat with her magic at the end and, you know, covered it, which is... You figure that out because of the comment of Red's, um, or Blue's, where she says, you know, my sister's too kind. And at first you think it's just because of getting to know him, but it's actually because she used the wind power, because you see later on, she uses the wind power against him when, you know, she tries to fucking kill him when he refuses to give information and Beatrice has to protect him. So mm. there's that that you learn. You also learn the, the, if you connect the dots, there is a, this is a little more obvious one though, that the power Subaru has is very likely given to him by the jealous witch because he has the scent yeah. on him and it's apparently strong. So why that is a thing we don't know for all we know there's a possibility that the jealous witch is the one who pulled him to this universe in the first place and gave him his power to do who the fuck knows what so that opens up a whole new can of worms of like what does this jealous witch have in store for him what what was the idea of bringing him here was like what what was the goal to be accomplished and even if she didn't bring him here it's still implied obviously that she gave him power so then in that regard it's still why did she do that so, you know, no, in that fucking can of worms, I mean, <laughs> the other thing we learn that if you connect the dots is I mentioned it before, but I was actually completely wrong was, uh, there was the scene in the first episode of this arc where Rose Walter, whoever the head name dude is, is talking to red, asking about Subaru's, you know, capability of being a spy. And I thought they were scouting him, but after watching this episode and going back, it turns out they were asking about his possibility of being a foreign spy to spy on them. So he was wondering if they were, if he was like infiltrating them, trying to get information. And Red was saying, no, it's probably not possible. Like th their conversation in, in that room, like you need to go back and watch. It takes on a whole different tone when you know the actual angle. Because Red's like, no, it's a possibility, but it's really slim. And Roosevelt's saying, as long as there is a possibility, we should take the safe route, which is very much implying that he may have given the order to fucking kill, torture him and get information out of him. Like, it may have come from Rosewall. So, there's also that possibility. We also learn a little bit about Beatrice, the fact that she's apparently very fucking strong because she had two people attack her in that room, and then later on it seems like she handled them just fine. So, there's that. There was also the, the, the line that uh, read throughout where it seems like Beatrice is either linked to that library room as far as, like, she can't leave or go from it too far, or, like, her power is linked to it, as in, like, the further away from it she is, the less powerful she is. Because there was the comment about Red, like, not saying, like, oh, you know, we're not near the library anymore. Like, do you really think you stand a chance against me? So there's a couple angles that we could, mm. you know, assess from that. But, I mean, th th those were the fucking notes I took. Like, that's what I was writing up, you know, to... to, to you know, I, to get out of this episode, like, that's kind of like that's... how you wrote all the things you didn't like about Cabanary last episode. Yeah. I have a note of all the things you could figure out from, like, connecting the dots and thinking about shit in this episode, this week's episode of ReZero. But I feel like I've, I've gone on a little too long on my thoughts as far as, like, all the shit you can get out of it. It, it was a fucking great episode. Mm. I want to know what you think, Lewis. What did you think? Yeah, it was a good episode. <laughs> I may have covered a little too much. Yeah, like, you've really covered everything. Um, There's just a few things I I'd like to add uh, while watching the episode. And that's mainly um due up to uh, the director more than anything. Um, what I kind of uh, thought to myself while watching this is that they uh, really ha nailed the, the entire feeling or atmosphere of uh, helplessness for Subaru. Like, you don't really know what the fuck he can do. There's, like, this this kind of... Uh, while he was running away, I think it was very prominent. It was like, what, 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 is, what is there for him to do? Does, does he run away? Does he forget his new problems? Does he kill himself? But, what, it, but if he kills himself, there might be consequences for that. Like, I don't... Like, there was that huge sense of helplessness of where he goes from here. And um, they nailed that this episode, which is... It goes hand in hand with the writing and how well they directed everything, but it was dead on, really. Um, another thing which I'm kind of interested in uh, is the title for the next episode, 
which is Subaru's restart. Um, now, I could just be looking into this a little bit too much, uh, but I, I feel like there's something more to that. The fact that like they're saying restart right and re-life means that it could have implications that he's going back to the very start of his actual ride. So he's not going to wake up in the mansion again. He's just going to wake up, I don't know, right outside the Apple store. And he's like, hey man, do you want an Apple or not? And that part, which is what I'm kind of like curious about. It would be a pretty weird thing to do, but it's, it's just what I think. That being said, I could just be looking at it too much and the literal, and it just literally means that he's going to restart from the bed again. And he's going to go about his own business, knowing all the info he knows. Um, on regards to uh, the, 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 the the witch, uh, Beatrice. You just to say that. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, like, I do feel like there's going to be a huge thing going with her but I feel like almost that it's going to be symbolic for the entirety of uh, the, the, the show like she there's never going to be like an actual physical interaction between Subaru and her it's just going to be this kind of overlooking uh, overarching plot I guess or, or, or yeah, I don't know what the word is but I guess it's kind of like a uh, fraction of Subaru's character like the only thing that's going to be representative of the witch is the actual dark hand which is Actually, seen in the OP now. I actually remember seeing that where it grasps, grasps Super's hand in the, in the yeah. I mean, it grasps Super's heart in OP. That's that's the correlation there. Um, other than that, I really have nothing else to add. Like you, you really nailed the the actual point home. Really, like it was, yeah, it was a fantastic episode. Uh, directing wise, you know, it couldn't have been uh, done better. Like. I think this is a good, um, I guess a good, like, uh, example, I guess, just to compare it to, uh, Carbonari when shouting and doing, uh, doing lines in very loud voices is effective, and it's an effective way of doing drama, whereas, so you compare it to, like, Carbonari when it's just, like, they do it every time, in this episode of ReZero, it's, there's meaning behind it and there's actual drive behind the characters and it's it feels a lot it feels intense and they're obviously doing a very good job of conveying that intenseness with the loudness of their voices and it's kind of funny usually i'm pretty against like over necessarily dramatic shouting but this episode really really proved me wrong in the sense that like it was it was a very good job done on the actual dramatic scenes, really. I'd, I'd say it's because of something that was mentioned somewhat before when we talked about this. It's that ReZero fucking earned it. Yeah. Because the yelling is, is largely on Red's part. There's, there's a little bit here and there also from Subaru. But the point of this is that, first of all, Subaru's been doing this arc all, through, through this arc for quite a while. So it's not like we've been yelling the entire arc. It's just mainly been building up to this. I mean, if you count Subaru's, like, death screams, I guess that counts as yelling. Um, yeah. And the beginning of this episode was yelling a lot, but that was, like, him unloading his emotions. So that worked uh, as far as, like, the yelling part. Like, uh, the, the yelling also has to be very, like, emotionally linked. Like, people aren't just going to yell because they're like, oh, God, something's happening. Oh, my God. Well, I mean, I guess if they were, like, in immediate danger, but then that would be because mm. of fear. You know, like, emotion is a part of it. But it's 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 earning it because... This episode was Subaru not doing anything. Like he willingly said, "I'm fuck this shit. I'm not. I'm not doing anything. Like I can't deal with this anymore." And then one of the maids died, and it's completely. Well, I guess it's kind of hard to say it's Subaru's fault, but the point is that you know it could have been prevented if he tried to do something, but he didn't. Like he was, he refused to to act. So it got you know it got blue killed, and so Red is fucking pissed. And you can understand, like, the basis for her anger and, like, the weight of her words actually means something beyond just the yelling because Subaru knows it too. Like, the, he could have potentially stopped this and he didn't. And then even after that, he didn't, he had another chance to stop it some more. Maybe he could have, like, tried again to tell people, you know, about the whole, you know, thing he knew. Or maybe he could have figured out a way to tell people his information, you know, without saying anything about his resetting power. 
but he didn't. He ran away, and that's why he got the fucking blood curling scream, you know, coming after him about how you know she's gonna fucking kill him. Mm. So it, it it's it's a matter of earning it, like you said. And uh, but as far as the other things you said too, like that was that was also good stuff that I like. I forgot to mention is like the opening now has way more meaning to it because of you know you know you now understand what the hand in that opening means like before you were like eh, maybe it's just symbolic now yeah. you actually know what it is so it's another case of like seeing things again and now they have more meaning to them like i will be surprised i they've been cutting it for time but i would be surprised if we don't get the opening next episode now that you know what the hand means yeah like because then it's gonna hit you harder um but you also mentioned the the directing, and there was a, a different scene that I actually wanted to mention the directing on that was I was impressed by, which was the, again, going back to the hand, the reveal of the whole hand thing. Because I may be slightly wrong because I didn't rewatch the episode yet, but the, the way the scene happened was so much better than how a normal portrayal would have been. And to be fair, a lot of it could have been in the original, like, light novel, as being described as far as, like, how this stuff, like, is shown. But... The, um, like, a, a normal show, when he revealed that, he would have said, he would have, like, been in the middle of his, his sentence saying about his reset time power, and, like, before he could finish his sentence, it would have, like, cut him off, and it would have done that, you know, you know the, like, reverb visual effect with, like, all yeah, the colors? Yeah, I know exactly where it's like, what you're about, yeah. and it would have had, like, the sound, like, that's what mm. you would get from every show, like, they do it all the time, that's what you would have gotten, which isn't bad, if you time it right and use it well, like, it can be impactful, but they went way further with this. Like, he finishes his sentence, and at first you think Amelia is just, like, not saying anything because she, like, doesn't know what to say. Before the camera angle gets oh, really yeah, fucking yeah, weird, yeah, and you yeah, notice yeah. no one's moving, like, even an inch. Like, not even, like, shit that should be moving. And then Subaru just starts talking, and you're like, he's like, wait, wh what the fuck is going on right now? <laughs> and then you see the hand start crawling. While, like, that was... That directing of that scene... And like I said, a lot of it could have be described, could have been described in the light novel, and it was just translated... But even then, like, transporting it visually, even if they had all that from the light novel, was still super fucking impressive with the presentation of it. Yeah. As far as, like, really nailing how fucking creepy it was. Like, I can't get over, like, you know, the fact that they went with that weird fucking angle to show you, like, that nothing is moving. And, like, time has just kind of stopped. Like, mm. that, that portrayal was just so fucking good. Like, seriously, like, you mentioned before, like, when you looked up the director... When, cause there was some other scene we really liked and he's done like jack shit. Like, yeah. where the fuck is this guy been? Like he's doing know, a fucking like... crazy good job. And maybe it's just like a marriage of like the perfect material with the perfect director. Cause that can happen a lot mm. is a director can put out a lot of stuff you don't really care about. And then they get that one material where everything just clicks. So it could be that it's hard to say cause it's his first thing he's fully directing. Like maybe the next thing to the top is complete shit, <laughs> but he's doing a fucking crazy good job of this show it's and surprising. it's it's just super impressive and it's gonna be like crazy like at this point like it's hard to pass it off as like before it was like maybe it's just coincidence maybe he's just getting lucky maybe he just happens to be making the right call and the yeah. longer the show's gone going on the more it's like this isn't a fluke like this <laughs> is like this guy knows what he's doing and it's paying off and working really well yeah. it's God, ReZero is just so fucking good. I wish people it were is. talking it's about like, this more so than Kabaneri. It's like, how good it is as well. Like, I was not expecting this at all. I know, man. Like, I, like, I, I might have to just put something out. Like, I, I need conversation to be more about ReZero than Kabaneri this season. Like, there's so <laughs> yeah. much more. Like, even as far as, like, likability. Like, that's not even the thing. Like, just as far as, like, conversations of things you can get out of the show to talk about. Mm. It's so much higher. Like, I, people need to be talking more about the show, whether it's in a positive or negative degree, I don't care. But right now, it just, it seems, wait, maybe, again, maybe I'm just in a bubble where, like, I'm not seeing the people talk about it, but there needs to be more discussion about this show. It's just, it's, it's just, just it's getting, we're getting so much out of this. It's just, yeah. it's so good. Ah, <laughs> oh, Jesus. It is but, a very uh, good show, though. But yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we just talked about how amazing an episode was for 20 minutes. Oh, God, Jesus. <laughs> uh, was that everything you wanted to cover, though? Um, yeah, no, it, it's been phenomenal. I think we, we did a good enough job on it, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I, th I think we've thoroughly covered that episode of ReZero. Yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, but that leaves us with one last show to talk about. Um, and thank God we're not in like the last couple. No, last two weeks we've been talking about the show. We've only had like a little bit of time left. We yeah. went overtime, but we haven't had much time to like talk about it. So we're always like trying to rush. But now we have a good chunk of time to like you know talk about it if there's anything to talk about, which is Bungo Stray Dogs. Mm-hmm. So what did you think of this week's episode and Ender to the two parter that started last week? What did you think, Lewis? Um, like. Uh, I think Bungo Stray Dogs at this point is just uh, re- reiterating what I think of it, and that is that char- character-wise, it is great. Um, plot, story-wise, it's nothing really special. Like the scenes while we're getting at the moment is just kind of, eh. It's just kind of the character interactions and everything which, uh, everything involving the characters, like, just even as basic as just, like, day-to-day conversation with them is just great to watch. Uh, and it's kind of proven by this episode, like, there was that sort of, um, clashing of ideals between Dazai and Gunikita at the end there, which was brilliant, really. If what they have that sort of twisted version of uh, justice, really, like Kunikita has that kind of uh, lawful good version of justice. Like everyone must have like a, f- a fair trial, and no man should die like like a pathetic by gassing or whatever. And Dazai just kind of like, well, justice is a weapon, man. You just, there's like this thing called karma and that. And it was just that clashing of the I- ideals, even though they've been kind of. Uh, I guess not necessarily rivals throughout the rest, throughout the entirety of the show, but they've just been kind of having altercations here and there that have been kind of lighthearted at best. Um, and this was like the first real confrontation they had, which was had legitimate meaning behind it, and it had like a legitimate uh, force behind it because they've just seen two people get shot right in front of them. Um, and two people that they had just been talking to, like, the same day, basically. And they had a confrontation of justice, and maybe I'm just kind of, like, a sucker for, like, a conversation of basic human ideals, but it was just great, really. Everything with just the lighting and how the lighting almost kind of uh, shaded the front of uh, Dazai, and it kind of just went on... It showed, it, it, it like laid on uh, the front of Kita Kita, just kind of like showing that contrast between them. It was all very well done, and that's probably the best part uh, of the episode for me. The, the part which I kind of like, um, when I finished the episode, that's the part which I went and replayed because there wasn't really anything spectacular that happened this episode. I rem- that I recall, anyways. Um, because anything else, everything else is just like the day to day things that's been happening in Bungo Stray Dogs. You know, there's a mystery, and they go and solve it. That's what they did. But that main character interaction, that confrontation at the end there was just brilliant. Really, I loved it. <laughs> yeah, this two parter definitely built up to that confrontation at the end. Like it was almost all in service of that ending scene, which made it work so well because of how everything built up to it. Um. Mm. I, I, you you mentioned the lighting, which is actually something that's been consistently interesting about the show. Like, we mentioned it in, um, Edgar Rampo's episode with his face and, like, the two police officers. Um, this episode, you mentioned it as far as the ending confrontation, but they also did stuff with it during the actual fight, too. Like, when the, uh, when that number power guy showed up, like, when he was confronting, uh, Kunikita, he was like there was like an almost like a concave of light coming from the entrance of the thing that was going past Kunikita, and the villain was like just in like the entrance of the shadow, almost as like showing like how he was out of reach of Kunikita. Like it seems like Igarashi's having a lot of fun with lighting this show. Like he's he likes playing around with it a lot. It's definitely something to keep your eye on and pay attention to. Not something obviously that's happening like the entire time, the entire show, but there are a lot of scenes here and there where it seems like he paid special attention to like how he wanted the scene to be lit, which was a, which is always a really nice touch. That's what I like about Igarashi. He likes all these little touches here and there yeah. that draw me in. Like we mentioned, we constantly mention all the time the character like movements and actions and things like that that really help inform their character as far as like uh you know just the things they do like almost a uh, 
physical communication of their personalities and stuff. We already mentioned that. But, um, but yeah, you, you mentioned that the plot isn't really anything to write home about. And I would say I, I agree, but I agree because I don't really think there is a plot. <laughs> like <laughs> this, this is very clearly a character centered story with like a plot just kind of dangling way over at the side if they ever want to like reach for it. Sort of like, uh, like, like the whole thing with the Port Mafia versus the, the detective agency. Like even that's not really much of a plot. It's characters kind of like, you know, clashing with each other for the most part. It may eventually bring up a plot, but it's it's already just a character thing, which is what mm. I would argue. Although it also helps that, you know, I with Igarashi and Akito, I I love Star Driver, and that was a whole show like that really didn't. The entire purpose of the plot in Star Driver was literally just, oh well, fuck, we should probably have something happen now <laughs> after you've gotten like, because that's how Star Driver works. It's like focused on a different character each episode, and then after a while, it was like it seems like it's about time. For things to happen although to be fair the plot developments usually correlated with something that was happening with the main character's development too so there was it wasn't completely random but the plot was largely for like a vast majority of the episodes just kind of a thing that was off to the side that it wasn't really that important and it's kind mm. of the same here with Bungo Stray Dogs like the plot's not really all that important because they didn't really bother to establish much of one but if they really wanted to have one the threads are there that they could do something with it yeah so that that's what I'd say about the the, the show. I mean, do do you say do you think maybe it being a character centered story is like a problem? Like maybe it's would you say that the the fact that there are threads for a plot and yet they're not using it is something that's like a reason why you keep mentioning that you you don't really care much uh, for it as a, on a plot angle and you're not well, just like, focusing on the characters. Well, the thing is though, like the the selling point, I I, I think I've really sold it. Really, is that. The selling point of the show is the characters, so it's kind of ridiculous almost to say, but Bungo Stray Dogs as a whole doesn't really need a uh, quote-unquote plot, really. It's mainly there so you could have basically why you had this episode, which was, I don't know, confrontation of ideals, uh... A, uh, just some basic character interactions here and there. It's just telling... Uh, character stories that are eventually going to lead up in an ultimate climax of either uh, a character's um, I don't know background or story or just a confrontation in general between two characters. The plot really is just there for the actual well, I say plot, but just the events of the show are just there for the characters to um, I guess just have a reason for why they are uh, going about their day-to-day -day shenanigans, I guess, and what uh, what leads them to where they are in when it comes to those actual confrontations. Like, they want a reason to get to those uh, moments with the characters, and the plot is, again, quote-unquote plot, is just there for uh, a means to an end for those things. Which, in any other show, would be um, a pretty big criticism, but I think it just works here because uh, the characters are set up so well, and it's kind of a given from the start that this is going to be a very character-based, uh, not necessarily drama, but just show that that if... Yeah, that's 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 just gonna be it. It's just gonna be character based, and a plot is secondary to the characters, which I guess, strangely enough, works for Bungo Stray Dogs. So I can't really criticize the lack of plot here. Yeah, something you were just mentioning is that um, I, I guess if I were to word it my own way, it's that the plot is in service of the characters and not the other way around, pretty much ever. Which is definitely yet another correlation I could make with uh, Star Driver, which I guess is another reason why, like, I'm, like, I, I don't really think about this kind of stuff as I watch Moongo Straight Dogs. I'm just like, yep, that was another good episode, whereas, like, you're the one who's kind of noticing that, you know, the plot's really just there to move things along with the character, whereas, like, I'm already, like, I, I kind of know what to expect almost, mm. so it's, it's, it's definitely a technique that, uh, well, not necessarily a technique, but a, a, what's the word, an approach that I have seen before, so I'm more used to. So it's kind of interesting to hear what you think about. But, um, 
yeah, it's 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 definitely just there for the characters to do things for the most part. Like, it's even even then, like the plot is largely character based. Like, I mean, sure, just some random fucking group just you know wanted to blow up the city and you know give the detective agency a bad name and shit like that. Um, but for the most part, like it was still character driven as far as like why they did it. like the ultimate you know Azure messenger or whatever was because she wanted um to get was it was it revenge on kunikita like or, or she, she just want to keep carrying on his ideals of like fucking shit up i think it was just like carrying on like the azura kings or like ways i guess i don't know yeah carrying on his work for the most part was was what she was doing um yeah so it, it it's like it, it's really hard to say what's a plot in this show honestly yeah. like it's I guess the rivalry between the Port Mafia and the Armed Detective Agency is really the only thing considered a plot because it's the only thing that's not entirely character focused because it seems like it's a thing that's almost a given. But even then, you can argue it's character focused because of you know Dazai leaving the Port Mafia and being part of the Detective Agency now, which could have definitely put fuel in the fire for their you know rivalry right there. So mm. it's I I don't know it's. It's really hard to say what gets what counts as a plot in this show, but even <laughs> if you could ow, find it, it's um, it, it's still in service to the characters. So, yeah, I mean, you, you're on the money as far as like the plot goes or the alleged plot. Yeah, quote unquote. Yeah, uh, yeah, like I I really think that's what's. The, the the strengths that uh of fungus trade ox is it's just it's character based it's telling character stories each episode um and that's been kind of consistent really they've just been telling character stories because that that was the that was basically kunikita's arc i guess really um you know mm-hmm. he had his run-ins with the azora king or whatever um and that was basically it it didn't really aid to that entire port mafia rivalry with uh the ag- the detective agency and really i feel like the they are, they're probably going to bring that port mafia thing in towards like the the last few uh last probably few episodes maybe the last three or something with dazai just to tie up a few loose ends really and just to give closure uh for the story well i guess for the anime as a whole really um as of right now though they're probably just going to continue what they've been doing which is just continue telling character stories i feel like the port mafia thing with the uh black hair dude with the little bit of white uh he's probably only going to become not necessarily relevant again but he's only going to be a main uh cause for concern when those probably last three or four episodes hit um, when they actually go and go ahead and going to give closure to the story, I could be wrong. They could be going for a, a, a I don't know, was it five, six episodes they got left now? They could be going for that sort of arc. Uh, but as of right now, Bungo Stray Dogs is doing a good job of just simply doing character stories. Yeah, yeah. I feel like if if the uh... I believe his name is Akutagawa or something, or because because that's the author name I believe that he's based on. But uh, yeah. if he comes back, it's definitely gonna like even then it'll be a conflict between him and Dazai. Like that's that'll be why he comes back, so they can do yet another character centered conflict, which seems obvious that they're saving for the end. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, was that everything about Bungo Stray Dogs you wanted to cover? Uh, yeah, yeah, good episode. Yeah. All right. So uh, we we actually finished under an hour this this uh, this week. So. Uh, nice job Good so job. uh you want to you want to plug yourself or should we just end it uh please um follow me on twitter i do some fantastic memes um uh, what oh, else shit. what else uh, uh i have a wordpress which i probably will update during the summer uh, it's about time <laughs> that's I did. a good one <laughs> uh, fuck you man um <laughs> uh other than that yeah that's me that's me nice well yeah. that'll that'll cover it then so uh that's it for this week and uh we'll see you next week hopefully on time so <laughs> see ya <laughs>